presentation. Am I speaking loud enough? Okay, I'll try to shout a little bit louder, yeah? Uh, I'm Sigrid Gershwood, I'm working for Wilhaben. This is Michael Bratko, Entschuldigung, Michael Greifenilla from Taylor Debs. And the title of our presentation is Surviving a Successful App Life. So my first question as a listener would be, what is successful? Okay, I'll try to answer that. When we launched two, is it three and a half months ago? Three and a half months ago. Until now, we nearly have 500,000 downloads of the Wilhelm app. Management thinks this is a success. So, but please keep in mind these are the combined numbers for iOS and Android. The next question, if I would be sitting here, would be okay, app launch successful, that's cool, but why are you launching 2013? Why not 2008 or 2009? I try to give you an honest answer to that. Wilhelm actually runs a Java-based application platform, we call it IAS internally, <coughs> and basically it's a complex code base. And the complexity actually stems from the fact that a lot of business logic is hidden or is implemented in Java server pages, is implemented in custom techlets, and a lot of code and session and information is stored in a HTTP session. So think about it, it's an old code base, it's a large code base, and it's a lot of business logic in GSP. So there was always the idea of having some sort of external API for customers, for apps, but it was always postponed. There was, there was always a feature to add, a bug to fix. I think Miriam, may I introduce Miriam? We discussed last summer, and we said, okay, we need to have those remote API, this REST API, and I suggested, let's do it. Let's start. If it's not good enough, throw it away, make it a better version. It's an opportunity to learn. So this is the reason. We have a complex code base. We have no external API, which brings us to an interesting fact. And the fact is, no REST API, no mobile apps. And this is a problem. So what we are doing here is we try to solve the problems one step after another. So what we did in the beginning, we focused on the REST API. Uh, technically, in terms of the Maven build, it sits beneath the user interface code. Yeah, yeah. We did some rewriting of code, we did some refactoring of code, we did some duplication of code, so we are pretty pragmatic about it. It needs to be working, but we don't want to break the existing code base. We are using the Jersey REST service stack for the implementation. Yeah, and after I think three months of development time, we had our shiny new version one of our REST API up and running. During the course of the implementation, we read a couple of books because frankly, it was our first big commercial REST API. And if you read a couple of books about how to design a good REST API, you're a little bit confused because you find a lot of controversial advices so after a while, we compiled this list of REST API guidelines. So if a developer is coming up and saying, Sigi, uh, how shall we do that? Do we need to put this functionality in the mobile app or shall we put it in the REST API? So we basically assembled a couple of default answers to this question. The, very, the most important thing in my opinion is the sentence, we have a smart API and we have stupid apps. Sounds good to you. Uh, when I look at the REST API and the responses of the REST API, I always see an automatically generated HTML page in front of you. So if you try to render an HTML page based on the REST API response and something is missing, like localized uh, text, localized text or images, or if you, are, if you are in the situation that you have to build a URL somewhere in the app, something is wrong. So I look at the REST API response and think, is it possible to map that automatically to a human readable website? I mentioned one thing, <laughs> we had quite a lot of discussion about it, Mike. The app's never building a URL. All the URLs are delivered by the REST API. Because this gives me more freedom actually to restructure the, the, the spaces, the URI spaces, 
it gives me more freedom to refactor my code. What we also did from the beginning, we thought about bootstrapping and versioning. As a matter of fact, if you write in brand new API, it's called version one. The chances are pretty good that version one is not the last one. The only reason why version one would be the last one is that nobody's using it. So if you have an API used by external customers, used by mobile apps, used by a lot of people, sooner or later you will have a version two. So what we did straight from the beginning was versioning. So we did a version one, and soon after those three months, we started the version two. And what we are doing is actually we can basically run those two versions in parallel on the same server. And we're using a couple of custom HTTP headers. Let's <coughs> have a quick example of the bootstrapping. What we did for bootstrapping was we have a well-known JSON or XML file. It's located at the Wilhaben AT, something like service registry. And it gives me actually the possibility to say, okay, what is my vendor? I'm looking for Wilhaben, I'm looking for a remote API. I would like to go, yes, either a dev environment or production environment, and I would like to use version 2.0 of this API. So what the app actually knows is one well-known entry point to look up the resources, to look up the root resources of the REST API that we have. You have a question about it? Okay. Uh, regarding custom HTTP headers, we are transporting a little bit of information with each REST API call. Why we are doing it? Yeah, let's say we have an interest who is calling us. So we have things called an application token. An application token is basically a token saying, this is a tailored apps application. It's running the Wilhelm app, and it's running the version 1.00 of, uh, of yeah, the Android or whatever installation. We have a user token to transport the credentials. We have a security version token, just in case we would like to upgrade our security requirements. An example would be to turn on request signing saying each REST API request is actually signed with timestamp. Yeah, basically what we're interested in, who is calling us, which app version is calling us, which development partner is calling us, let's say for charging, tracing, or whatever you're interested in. Cool, we have an API, it's a good API. It's, it's still version one at that time, but it's a good API. But I would like to come back to our original program. And the original program was, we still don't have any apps. We have a cool REST API, but we have no apps. Okay, let's take the, set the second step. We would like to implement native Android and iOS apps, but unfortunately we don't have the know-how know in-house. So looking at the know-how, you say either we build this know-how up internally, which takes quite some time, the second option is to find a development partner. And we found tailored apps, micro tailored apps. Yeah, but we at Wilhelm, we are pretty much hands-on and pragmatic. <coughs> so we said, well, tailored apps, you're writing good mobile apps. Question, would you like to do a, let's say, one-day workshop? So the idea is, let's make a one-day workshop. Meet, meet in a room, lock the door, provide some food, provide some coffee. We would like to write an iOS and Android prototype within one day, which should be runnable on the mobile. Yeah, let's do it. So some impressions, some photos of this one day <laughs> workshop. So Hannes is here, Michael is here, Susanne. Okay, he's not here, it's my colleague of mine. This is product management testing the apps. <laughs> we are hands on. Let's have a look what ha yeah, what actually was the result of this one day. So this is a screenshot. It's, I think that's from the simulator, it's not the real phone. Okay, we don't know actually. So if you look at the navigation screen, you see we have basically, diff we call it verticals, different parts of the Wilhelm platform. One vertical is actually motor-driven vehicles. So we are in the vertical motor, we have cars, we have motorcycles, whatever. Within such a motor-driven 
a type you can refine the search. Let's say you would like four wheel drive, um, automatic, whatever. And based on the refinement, you get a search result. The search result contains mm -hmm. a short description and an image. What you can do, if you're interested in one particular car in the search result, you click on it, you see a more detailed description, and we have images, we have a list of images you can look at. And I think that's pretty cool for one day. Just imagine you're called in to a customer, you say, yeah, your task at hand is, you spend one day, you write an Android iOS prototype, it should be running on a phone, with a completely alien API you have never seen before. Good work. Okay, so we have our prototype. Now I hand over to Mike. And yeah, Mike is telling you about his experiences. Okay, so we had the prototype, but there were at least three months until the release, at least. And so I would like to uh, talk about about the, the process. Uh, first, the uh, product management and uh, user interface designer from tailored apps uh, were developing sketches, mock-ups, mock and screens. Um, they had a few iterations to um, that would look like this. So there were mock-ups um, planning the whole application and takes some time, um, and we as uh, app developer got the final screen, the mockups, and we, we worked with the, the API team to um, on site to develop the app. So um, the product development got the order to create the API before us, and. Um, they said um, to Siggy and his colleagues to provide the same uh, features as the website, basically. Um, so they provided <coughs> us the, the, the interfaces and we got the mock-up and screen from the product management. We worked uh, based on a Scrum principle, so we had our weekly iterations, so we could give feedback to the API, maybe they should change something, if there were fields uh, missing, or we got feedback, how does it feel, how is the uh, app um, feel in the hand, if you, ha if you have it in your hand, you sometimes have a different opinion about how it should work. So that works um, uh, in iteration. Um, I would like to um, talk yeah, probably it's well, but it's like, okay. Uh, so the test phase was, uh, we used the alpha channel of the Google Play Store that was uh, introduced in, at the Google I.O. this year. It was at the same time that we started testing. So we distributed the, the app during that time um, to all uh, uh, Wilhaven employees. They could test it if they uh, were interested. Um, what we also got the got the experience that it was not that easy for aggressive testing. It was much easier just to send the, a link to a APK file because we found that there are three barriers to for them. They need a Google Plus account. That's somehow not that difficult, but um, maybe not some want, don't want it, to use one. Or, but the second barrier, I think, is more important because the community was not visible to the public. So we could not say, oh, we have now a we'll have a beta tester community and everyone can um, uh, participate. So the user had to opt in, had, had to opt in but they couldn't uh, on their own. So we, have, we ha would have to invite them to the community and then could allow them to, um, to take part of the test program. And so there are also many steps required. Now you have to accept the invitation, follow the link, accept testing, go to the Play Store, download it. So it's easier to uh, use the, the link. Um, one thing I would really like to um, 
talk about it as I said, in simple case, because that's uh, a common case everyone is facing. Because the, the product management wants to have, they will have a flag ice wing. You know this from maybe the user interface uh, classes or um, it's, uh, so the, the product management wants a simple app. Yeah? And the app developers have this legacy system, le mm -hmm. legacy, legacy system, um, where, yeah, JSP and business code. And so they try to do the best. To get it somehow working. Get it somehow working, yeah? And we were in the middle, so um, we tried to somehow get it, but we had to use it um, as it was even much better as API developers. And the search and filter case is interesting because the product management wants a simple search and filter interface. So if we want to search something, just enter the keywords, say price and region, uh, and go. But the product development, the API developers, assumed that the API should provide a functionality that um, was similar to the existing platform. So if you know Wilhelm, there, is a, there are two parts you have here. Filters, uh, full, uh, full text search, and the search result. And what's, what's interesting is that if you click here on any of these links, you will get another result. So you go iteration, um, iteration um, to the next result set. So if you're on the Wilhelm uh, website, it's easy. Click here, next result. You get a new result set. You get a new uh, list of options. You have, uh, for instance, the price is here from 0 to 9, 10 to 100, <coughs> up to 1,000 something. And if you would uh, dive in and say, oh yeah, I want to use 400 to 499 results, you would get that the next um, option would be 400 to 420, 420 to 440. So the user interface would provide you a more uh, finer granularity. And, but that's the problem, that on the app, you only have either results or the filter, and it was somehow very difficult to uh, express this in the app. I mean, so you still have users complaining that they don't understand how it works, but that somehow <coughs> we have to live with and in the tablet app, that, that will be better. <laughs> you can see both. <laughs> there is more room. Yeah. Um, I would like to talk shortly about the technical components if you're interested. Of course, we use the action bar Sherlock. Um, at that time, the action bar compatibility library wasn't um, uh, shown to the public. Um, we use Android annotations. <coughs> we use uh, uh, robot files for the network stuff with Spring, Android, and Gene. Um The universal image loader is really very good. We have implemented it um, at Taylor at least, I don't know how many times. And this one is really good. We use the endless adapter that's um, from, the, from, Mark, from Mark Murphy fame. And what really was impressive is that the Google Play service, uh, we use that for location. I mean, that was also introduced only recently, and um, if you want just the current location, it's very convenient to use them. And it's very um, uh, interesting that we had no complaints by the users. I mean, everyone had to use, install the Google Play service if they have uh, an old version. And, um, and it's, it's on every phone, but no complaints about that. I, would, I thought that would be more problem but wasn't enough. We used ARMS in the beginning and now we use Cradle to make the build. Um, the power of open source is somehow <coughs> also very interesting because in the last week of the before the release we found that we have a big memory leak problem and so I 
you use the exist memory an analyzer to um, uh, found this problem. So, and, and I got the hint that <coughs> there were uh, uh, robots by this now. That was uh, still um, somehow uh, referenced. <coughs> and the funny thing is that we use the robot quite because we want to avoid somehow the memory because it's used a service that is decoupled from the activities and so they're running in the background and does not really keep the activities and so, yeah. But good thing <coughs> is that if you have an open source um, library and there's no solution on the mailing list and you can fork the, the code, and I just removed the listener. I didn't know if it would work. I just tried. And it um, really uh, shows that there was the memory that was gone just by removing the, the uh, request cancel listener, listener. It was just one line, but it fixed it. And the memory link was gone. And I created a, a pull request, and it was incorporated, and later the refactor the whole system back here. <laughs> um, what, I, what also I think is interesting is that um, device fragmentation, I mean, the Google Play Store says that the Will Haben app is supported on 3,625 uh, devices. I mean, we support from 2.2 .2 to the latest Android version, that's 11 levels. It's not really a problem, I mean, you have to use action power shadow, you have to use um, maybe uh, not the latest uh, <coughs> UI element sometimes, but I only want to um, show four small uh, annoyances. Uh, I think one is really funny that um, we got on the first or second day of the release, we got the feedback that it doesn't work in the Sony Xperia 25 or something like that, it was a 2.x Android device. And, and the, the people said, uh, I cannot press the button. I cannot press the button. And if you know the Android, uh, the Android app, and the app, app, then we, we can press everywhere here. So the click listener is on the whole layout. And this is just text -based. They are they are on the button. But I, I made the mistake that somehow the the style was in uh, was was um, uh, inherited from a holo page style, so that was my mistake. I had I did it wrong, and of course there was no click listener on the text field. It was on the layout. In the, in the layout that was using we were using, and so the user were confused, and it looked really ugly. I mean, that it was a, a small fix, but was because it was a Sony, it didn't show on any other device. So what's funny is too that if you just use simple date format, it's a common Java uh, library from one Java 1.0 probably 1.8. Agent. Agent, yeah. So if you say simple date format with this pattern and you send this pattern uh, the, the value of the date in this pattern to the server, and you get this as a response, you, you're not sure what this thing that's wrong. And <coughs> you still don't know. Um, we have, for instance, the first one is a, a node 7, or a node 5, I don't know. <coughs> yeah, it's a node. And um, we have tested it on our test device, and it works perfectly. But here, you can see there is no separate separator between the hours and the minutes, and on the plate there is, uh, what, what was the problem here? There's a, yeah, additional zeros, <coughs> and yeah, on this coupad, a device I've never heard, you can only question mark, yeah, I don't know what to do <laughs> with this device. Pause it. Huh? Pause it. <laughs> okay. Um, Caching is somehow some um, some messages on the Stack Overflow suggest that the HTTP cache is not really uh, cleanly implemented on Samsung devices, or that's also a, a thing that <coughs> was somehow a problem that it 
say, oh yeah, we fucked up, sorry about it, give me some sort of dump, I'm happy with it, we can fix the problem. And you would have enough time to fix critical issues before hitting hundred thousands of real users. Product management says, yeah, that's right, it would be a really good idea, but we need to become a top app. Top rated, top downloaded, top important, top something, doesn't matter. And I have to tell you that product management won. So we settled for the hard lounge. <coughs> Having said that, we said, well, you know, <coughs> hard lounge is sort of critical, yeah? I mean, it's a trick you can play once or twice, but sooner or later, you will fail. So we said, okay, let's make a hard lounge. Not a big issue, but we need some additional time to prepare. So we got allocated a little bit of time so we were running a 12 hour performance test maximum load for the servers to make sure that the servers are not crashing because we really had no idea how much traffic we would get during the first week. <coughs> then, what, yes? A question about that. Did you come up with assumptions for the load testing, for example, or did you just... Yeah, we came up with wrong assumptions. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the good thing is the wrong assumption was actually too high. We okay. expected a lot more traffic than we actually got. So I think my initial statement, the servers are idling, yeah. But you know, you are lucky, yeah. If it turns out the other way, you're, you're basically down. What we also did was quite interesting. Hard launch means, okay, let's retest everything. Let's take down database server and look how it behaves on the mobile side. So 
if you bounce database, is the app store working? Is the server still working? Is the app store working? Or if you take down a remote part, I think we have a job platform which is run on a separate server. If you take down the job platform while navigating for jobs, is the app store working? What happens if we bounce uh, an, uh, our servers over the load balancer? Does it work if I bounce one server, all the traffic is routed to the second one and going back? So that's the thing we basically <coughs> retested for our hard launch. Then we also reviewed system monitoring. Because the worst case of system monitoring is support people standing in front of your desk or management saying the user are complaining that the app or the server is not working. So what's really important when you do a hard launch is keep an eye on your server. And of course, what we also did, we updated our deployment procedures. Because if you're hitting, let's say, what was the number? One hundred, oh, I have the numbers here. We got 40,000 downloads the first day and 100,000 downloads the first week. We're talking about Android right now, right? No, it's all together, iOS and Android. How did you manage to make your hard launch with iOS? Uh, we also wrote the native iOS app. Yeah, I mean, how did you, were you able to get Apple to launch it on a certain day or? Was yeah, yes, you can do it. Can do that. Yeah. We had the iOS application um, basically accepted and it's much quicker actually to launch the Android app. Yeah, so basically know. the deadline was set by Apple and okay, the iOS yeah, and the endpoint was basically <laughs> aligned to that date. Yeah. The bottom line is Monday morning we sent out I think 100,000 of email, we updated our advertisement on the website, we sent out Twitter, Facebook, whatever, yeah. Even we sent out marketing people to for flyers, whatever. <laughs> so if you have that many users <coughs> on the first day of your production server, the first week of your production server, you have to make sure that you can release at least once or twice. That's basically the worst time to update your deployment procedures when you are down. So we did that, so we were pretty confident that it would work out. So the impression of the first week, yeah. the impression <coughs> of the first week is, sorry about the word, fuck, we still have many errors in there. It's quite amazing, you have an app out there and the people find a lot of dormant bugs there. I never saw them, never basically noticed them, but they're out there, people are hit by them, people are sometimes quite upset. I see sometimes I'm looking for the log, or actually looking for the log files daily, yeah? So sometimes you see, you see a user doing the same thing 10 times basically, try to, you have a bug, you retry it again, okay, it doesn't work, you stop the application, and you retry it again, and retry it again, and it's still not working. So I really can appreciate the user saying, let's bug it off there, yeah? But the problem is you have so many devices out there and you have so many strange bugs on those devices, iOS and Android. So I can really understand the frustrated user. Mm -hmm. But what we did is we had a lot of bugs out there. For some bugs it was possible to basically make, we call them first eight patches. You know you have a bug out there on the app, but you also know you can work around this bug on the server side. Uh, you remember those custom <coughs> we had? We had in the beginning, so I basically know who is calling me. I know an Android version 1.0.0 is calling me, and I do know for this particular Android version, let's say the date is wrong, yeah? Or it's not, it's, yeah, it missed some parameters, I got the wrong parameter. I can work around those things on the server side. So what we did in the beginning is we were working around these problems by first eight patches. Yeah, that actually forced us to release twice a day for the first week. You remember release procedures and review, it's really important. Yeah, I think we survived the first week. And yeah, we are a nice company. So what we do after the first week of surviving, we party. So we had, uh, how do you call We had the first lounge party, I think we had three of them, yeah? It was the lounge party. <laughs> it was a question. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> was there more uh, dormant bugs in Android than iOS? Mm, Mike would say more in iOS. <laughs> <laughs> Matthias would say more in Android. Yeah? I think we have slightly more in Android because you have much, you have many more devices out there, or different types and different versions of devices. In that sense, iOS is much easier. <coughs> okay, we had a lunch party. Now it's 14 weeks later, and this is actually the point where I hand over to Mike again. Yeah, I thought what would be 
interesting uh, about the relation is that um, we have four graphics for you. So we have the installation history. And for, for instance, the started with the build 44. And we, um, so and this version, I mean, that's the version 1.0. Still at eight percent at that version. So, if you release a version, um, some people won't touch it. <laughs> so you have still this version in the one field. And um, is it actually still used? Do you track that? I mean, application uh, usage. Uh, this is something I have to implement next week. Okay. So the question <laughs> is, which which versions of which operating system is still in use? So this is basically a trivial task for me next week. I would like to answer that real time. <laughs> no reporting, real time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, but maybe yeah. you are more interested in the distribution of the network version, probably. And you can see that um, there are on, we are supporting 2.2, but we have only around one person of them are using 2.2, so it's probably not that important anymore. Um, we still have uh, 17. 2.3, so it's the second most used API level. But um, the and you can see that uh, if you check the device distribution, we have a lot of Samsung devices. So it's good to have Samsung test devices <laughs> because most of the users are using them. So at least you know, I, I mean from this at least. 40%, <coughs> and uh, so so the Android 4.1 is <coughs> mostly Samsung devices on this version. So and they are from last week. So I probably. Do you think it's worth considering uh, supporting Android 2.2 if it's only one percent in use? Wouldn't it be smarter to dedicate your development time? Uh, to the bigger features yeah, and drop support? Yeah, I mean, there, was, there was not much change between 2.2 and 2.3. I mean, oh, um, 2.3 you have an... Uh, hmm? 2.3 isn't much either, so that's... Uh, 2.3, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah. yeah. okay. so that's a uh, large amount. Um, yeah, but 2.2 is, yeah, I mean, there's no... Ma not many APIs that you would yeah, you, that are in 2.3 and not in 2.3 uh, 2.2 so not really it. Um, yeah and you can see that our <coughs> one eight or nine device is already a tablet so and the tablet distribution is we have already uh, how much 20 <coughs> 20 20,000 uh, uh, installation on tablets, and I have done some um, aggregation. So we have 20,000 uh, installation on tablets. So we are already working on a tablet uh, version because 10% of the installation on Android are using them on their tablets already. It works on tablets, and we have a lot of white space, and but it will get better with the next version. And Finding and we are done. Yeah. So if you are still awake, <laughs> we would like to invite you to yeah come up with a few questions. We try to answer. So who would like to be the first one with the first <coughs> question? Yes. Um, how do you come up with the idea that uh, you are going to develop the native application and as your web developer just wrap whatever you have uh, into phone gap and push it to the market? <coughs> okay. The question: Why to start with native? instead of hybrid solutions or mobile web. Yep. Uh, this question was fortunately answered by product management. <laughs> yeah, hey, that's money, yeah. So product management said we would like to have the very best user experience for the people out there. And the very best user experience means going native. Having said that, if you have less budget and less time, 
I would have thought, okay, let's go for mobile web and push out the native applications later or try to fix the native applications. But platform with that many users were basically forced to provide native apps. But I have to agree with you, it's an expensive decision. Ask Miriam about it. Another question, please? Come on, guys. How many people in here? No questions. Uh, can you cover the uh, because you mentioned like 10% of users are using mobile apps on tablets. Uh, how many tablets are used in regular apps? So, I mean, it's kind of, if the tablet is big enough, it makes more sense to use the website instead of the application. Uh, so, have you looked at those numbers? Uh, I think we have the numbers, but I don't have them at hand at the moment. We do track that. <coughs> we know that a lot of tablet users are actually u using either the full blown website, it's the stuff in the web we have not here. I think there are actually two mobile websites out there, and quite frankly, those two mobile websites are not very good. So, that's a polite expression for their web app. So, one thing we're currently doing is we're implementing a new mobile website. we have. 
and give us feedback what works nicely and what is broken. And this is basically the thing we did through the whole development. They were giving us feedback. I don't understand this. Okay, I try to explain it. And they say, well, it's okay. Sometimes they say, it's broken. And I say, that's right, it's broken. So I will fix it. So that's basically the feedback loop we created. We have a REST API, we have actually some guys using this API, and those some guys sometimes say, no, I don't understand it, or this is broken, or this is faulty, or whatever. So this gives us basically feedback to improve the API. And sooner or later, we will have a version three of that. Okay, a last question. Was, was the API developed before the mockups or afterwards? No, it was developed before the mockups. So this, this was basically the confusion we had. Mike tried to explain it to you. Product management would have been happy with a simple form where you type in all parameters, you hit the button, you make a search, and the search tells you zero result. Or you change something to another search, still zero result. That would have been the idea which project management had. Product development had those other models, this refinement, drill down model in mind. But you say, you are not, as a user, you are not sitting down on the form and formulate the query. You play around with the application. You start something, you say, okay, I would like to rent a flat. Oh, I could be fourth district. Hmm, I have 2,000 flats here. Oh, this one looks a little bit expensive. I would like to have the cheaper ones. And yeah, now I have two hundreds of them. And a balcony would be nice. And elevator would be nice as well. So, so you see the difference. You make a drill down, you have a navigation, you have a drill down, which brings you to the desired result you would like to see, versus a simple search form. You type in all parameters and then it says, sorry, no result. This was a mental difference we had. PM would have been happy with a simple search form. We had this, we had this different approach in mind, but you're using the, the API, you're using the mobile apps, you see something, you make a drill down until you find the parking you have removed. <laughs> and this was actually, yeah, this was a sort of mental problem we had. So the recommendation would be to first uh, think of the mock up and then perhaps the design data? Yeah, it would have been, yeah, that could have avoided our problem. I'm not 100% sure of it because what we did initially was when we were writing the API, we were writing a little sort of uh, JavaScript HTML page for that, so we could actually use and make all those refinements on the browser. But I would say this distinction between plain vanilla search and grill down refinement, whatever, is not so obvious when you use it. The implementation is completely different, but for the user, it there is not such a big difference. It makes a difference, but it's not very obvious in the beginning. If you implement it, you see, oh, this is it's a very opposite, <coughs> uh, very opposite views of, of the same thing. Okay, La very last question. Mm -hmm. If there are no further questions, I would like to hand over to Product Management because Will Harden is one of the sponsors of DevFest. Yeah, and they will take the opportunity to quickly introduce Will Harden up here. Go to the same, please. I do the hard task, switching over to PowerPoint. <coughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much, Sigi and, and Mike, for this uh, very good insight into how we have is working. Mira and me want to show you now um, some, some more overview, so to say, about our culture and some, I think, important things about the Um Well, we have is the, um, the biggest classified portal in Austria, which means we have about two million um, ads in our database, active ads, um, and we get about 50,000 um, new ads per day. And at peak time, it's like this, that we get uh, three or four ads per second. Um, we did some, some calculation yesterday, because we are interested in, in some, some figures, and we have seen that um, the amount of all published ads at the moment is about 16.5 billion euro. So this is a, a really um, amazing number. I never thought that it would be that high. It's 
not only the old new stuff that actually nobody needs, it's quite a... Uh, it's a lot of stuff we can't yeah. afford. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what we really like at Luhaben is that we are doing our business for, for real people. Um, at the moment, mm -hmm. 2 million Austrian um, <coughs> internet users um, are using Luhaben. So if you are, um, let's say, somewhere at Kaufplatz, you can say, okay, um, about 30% of, um, of the people you will meet there, they are using Luhaben. So if you implement a new feature, um, it will be used immediately by the people outside. And in fact, if you implement a bug, you will see it in, in a couple of minutes later on. Um, the, our, the, our users like to have, we, we have seen that um, about 99% of our users recommend we have to their friends or to their family. So we've seen that the platform that is really liked by the users. Um, well, some technical stuff is, I think, important. Um, we have about 550 million page impressions per month, which is much more of the OIF, the Austrian Broadcasting, uh, and much more of GMX, AT. Um, so we are really the biggest platform in Austria. In the peak times, we have a traffic of about more than 500 megabit per second. Um, well, I think we are not as big as Google, but we are working on that. Um, and last but not least, um, we have is a really big contribution to our environment. Just um, think what would happen if all the things that are bought and sold at Wilhaben would be thrown away. So this will be, would be lots of waste. And Wilhaben, um, um, <coughs> well, it, with, it, with Wilhaben, um, we save the environment, so to say. <laughs> um, all the, the, the stuff is reused and will not become waste. <coughs> um, so who are the people behind it? You, you've met Mike and Sigi, um, Thomas is the head of development at Wilhelm myself, I'm head of product management. Um, what do we do, how do we work? We're a great place to work. Is that familiar to any one of you, what that is? Okay, um, it's an independent survey that's done, <coughs> that's conducted once a year for all our employees. Currently we're 80 people, so these 80 people are asked about um, how well they feel treated in the company, how happy they are with how they can increase on their skills, with how, they, how their work space is arranged, how much they like their product, how much they feel happy with their colleagues. And um, from this survey, the best places to work are uh, always like awarded. And for the last four years, we've always been among the top um, companies. And that is really something we're proud of and something we're working on every day. How do we do that? Um, we look in the same direction and try out new things all the time. We learn from the ones who are best in the team. Um, we do have a lot of fun. Sometimes we improvise. So this boat down, down there is quite a bit more professional than the one up there, but both of them are working. Um, we treat each other really well. We um, see our working time as part of our life and not um, like an extra part that actually no one really really wants. Um, we treat ourselves well. You can actually see our CEO, she's preparing breakfast for all of us because we do have monthly breakfast and everyone takes this of her turn to provide breakfast for anyone. That's becoming more and more work because we're growing, but so we team up and just do it in bigger, bigger teams. Then we have breakfast <coughs> together, get to get a chat and um, see what everyone's working on. And we're actually, we're very proud of being part of this team, and we feel it's here quite often because there's challenges everywhere all the time for the two million people we're actually um, <laughs> doing that for. Um, we do celebrate our successes. When we had $200,000, we did have another party. We did see that cake already. That's how we were slicing it. Um, that was cake with cake candy. Yeah, cake and eggs. And eggs actually tasted good as well. We are quite worky and motivated and we meet every challenge. We actually make people also into runners and sports people because we're very enthusiastic about it. We are a team and actually we're here to win. Um, Wilhelm has a top number one strategy in all aspects, whether this is number of ads, whether this is amount of revenue in a certain segment. So it is quite a challenging field, but we do actually win quite a lot, which is 
really rewarding. And the good thing is this incredible company is staffing at the moment. So if you or some of your friends happen to be interested in meeting a challenge like that, trying to be part of a team like this one, people like us, um, you're very welcome to apply or just recommend it, as many people do. Um, see there's some empty spaces on this wall and we'd really like to team up with you. If you're interested, there's the ads outside as well or you can directly write an email to my colleague Tom.